Hi everyone, I'm Dee Good. I'm with Drala Mountain Center and it's my pleasure today to be here with Greg Smith, who is a long-term practitioner, long-term resident of Drala Mountain Center, and the leader of the upcoming Chakra Sambara practice retreat. So welcome, Greg. Thank you, Dee. I wanted to find out a little bit more about Chakra Sambara practice for and and to share this with people who may not have um, the practice authorization and uh, just to learn a little bit more about it. So I'm curious, can you talk to us about the origin of the practice and what it means to you and what it means to the our community at large? Yeah, well, the, the Takasambara practice comes from uh, Kaku lineage, particularly and came from India, from the Tantric Buddhist tradition of India, and uh, was practiced by Tilopa and Naropa. And then Marpa, the translator, uh, went to India, brought these teachings back to Tibet, and gave them to his students Milarepa, and went on to Gampopa and the Karmapas of the Kagyu lineage. And uh, so for the first uh, 13 generations, Tilopa specified that the practice and the Tantra should be given to just one person at a time for 13 generations. And then at the end of that, uh, it could be distributed widely to many practitioners. And so that was done. So at the time of the Karma, I, I can't remember which one it was, uh, he was visited by the teacher of the first Trungpa, whose name was Trungmase. And, um, and the Karmapa immediately recognized that this person was the person he should give the, the teaching to for uh, it to be distributed widely. And, uh, and so that way it uh, entered into the, the lineage of the Trungpas and our teacher, uh, Chögyam Trungpa, uh, had this as really the kind of uh, uh, crown of, of the lineage of Trungpas. And, uh, and interestingly, he uh, was willing to give that, you know, the real treasure teaching of the Trungpa lineage to many of his students who uh, were author, were, you know, able to receive that teaching. So and, the Vidyadara uh, shared that, uh, the Vidyadara Chugyam Trungpa, Chungpa Rinpoche shared that with students. Yes, yeah, so Trungpa Rinpoche uh, shared it with his students and it's, it's kind of unusual if you think about uh, a lot of the uh, Tibetan teachers who have taught in the West and I don't think many of them are really willing to take the kind of highest jewel of their lineage and impart it to the Western students. There's some kind of little bit of uh, uh, mistrust of the Western students, but Trump Rinpoche really trusted his students and so was willing to uh, to give them uh, the highest uh, uh, teaching that he had. Wow, that's really, um, that's worth pausing to consider for a moment, right? Um, and what does the practice mean to you and uh, and our community at large? Yeah, well, within the Shambhala uh, community, <clears throat> it holds a, a special place. And it's an interesting question why <clears throat> Trungpa Rinpoche, who I think, you know, in my estimation, and for many people, his main teachings really were the Shambhala teachings. And so the question is, you know, why, why did he start his students with all these uh, Kagyu lineage practices? And then it seemed, you know, switch to uh, the Shambhala lineage uh, teachings later. And I think it was uh, because it was a way to uh, give his students a, a foundation in first basic Buddhism, and then in uh, the basic path of Vajrayana, uh, because the Shambhala teachings are really a Vajrayana teaching as well. And so, um, since, the, since the Shambhala teachings were, in a sense, a new lineage, 
although there's you know lots of history to Chimbala teachings that's, that are mixed in with the Tibetan Vajrayana um, as a distinct lineage, it hasn't been presented before. And so uh, in order to create a foundation for that lineage among Western students who did not have um, you know, any foundation in Buddhism, he wanted to uh, bring them in with the Kagyu Vajrayana teachings. I know that a lot of the, um, you know, the actual practices and the liturgy is um, restricted. But I wonder if there's anything that you can say or any elements that you can share about um, the view um, or, you know, the special significance of Chakrasamvara to people who don't have that authorization. Yeah, so, um, well, you know, so one needs to have a, you know, quite an extensive practice history in order to receive this teaching. Um, so it's not something that everybody can do. Um, one first needs a foundation in Buddhism uh, altogether. Um, but what can we say to this, uh, say about this? Um, this practice to those who are not on that path or not yet on that path. Well, first of all, it's a long-standing, well-practiced path, uh, which has uh, who is, which has br brought results. It, it brings the result of enlightenment, and many people have attained enlightenment and high realization with this practice of chakras Samara, Especially, it's kind of very famous within the uh, Kagyu and other Tibetan lineages as a very effective path uh, to enlightenment. Um, and uh, so you might ask, you know, why do this practice, which was developed in India, you know, a thousand years ago or more, um, you know, why, why don't we work with something new? Well, you know, maybe somebody could develop something new that uh, does the same thing, but if Uh, if you were to have something new, it would basically have to be the same thing because human beings haven't changed. And uh, so this has been laid out and thought out very well by many very wise people in the past. And so it comes to us in a very complete form. And uh, so as to you know what the practice is about, you know, it's it's kind of uh, the higher practice of the basic practice of Buddhism, which starts with, first of all, getting to know oneself really well. That's where you start looking at yourself. And uh, as we say, practicing meditation, which is getting to know oneself. And uh, when we do that, we see the good and the bad. We see our virtues. We see our weaknesses. And we realize that all of this is our potential. And um, the next phase is to develop uh, a sense of warmth and kindness to ourselves and to others. And then based on that, then we can begin to skillfully practice to uh, deal with some of our problems basically deal with our yucky stuff. And uh, there was a great uh, Zen teacher, Suzuki Roshi, who was uh, heard to say, um, you are perfect just as you are, uh, but you need a little work. <laughs> so that's kind of where we find ourselves. And, you know, Buddhism is very clear, and especially Shambhala Buddhism, that, um, that we actually have enlightenment as our basic but we also have some problems that are kind of overlaying and obscuring that so we need to work with the obscurations and so chakras and bar practice is kind of like a cosmic bathroom where we can clean ourselves up 
And it's very skillful that way. And it deals with really all the phases of the path. Because in the liturgy of Chakra Samara, which is a hundred page text, um, you go through all the all the levels, starting with, you know, discovering yourself, making friends with yourself, understanding what the obstacles are, uh, you know, uh, Uh, working with those obstacles and then finally working with the the brilliance that uh, we discover when we remove the obstacles and increasing that brilliance so that's what the chakra samara practice is about sounds amazing and fascinating i've also heard that um it's very beneficial for example to have this practice um or you know a practice retreat of this nature uh on the land for drala mountain center and so how in what way can it benefit um when this practice is conducted in a retreat setting like you will do soon at drala mountain how can it benefit the land yeah and others and the people you know yeah well, yeah, I think you could say whenever a group of people uh, engages in deep practice, uh, it has an effect on people around them. That, uh, you know, merely the fact that those people choose to do that, you know, opens up a dimension uh, which naturally would be shared in the environment of people around them. Okay. How does the practice of Chakra Samvara um, benefit or support the vision of Drala Mountain Center overall? Yeah. Well, so we have to understand that uh, when Trungpa Rinpoche uh, founded this place, as uh, Rocky Mountain Dharma Center back in the beginning. Um, he uh, envisioned this place not only as a Buddhist practice center, but as a place where we would invite um, people from other wisdom traditions to come together. And he didn't do this. He, this was not the vision that he uh, had uh, for other centers, such as Karma Chowling in uh, Vermont and other centers, you know, that were more just geared towards uh, Buddhist practice. Mm -hmm. But he felt that uh, this particular place would, would be this place, it would be kind of an uh, umbrella uh, for uh, other wisdom traditions. And so very early on, I remember in the, in the early days, um, when I was here in the early 80s, um, suddenly uh, we were renting the place out to the Sufis. And Pir Vilayat Khan came with hundreds of his students. And uh, we were kind of pushed out as staff, pushed out of, uh, of our kitchen even. We had to have a campfire kitchen for the staff. And uh, we had all these Sufis here. and. Uh, so again, it comes back to this idea of uh, wisdom traditions having some kind of basic agreement. And uh, so you can't just say everything, you know, it's all good. No, there are particular traditions which ha actually hold a kind of valid and uh, real sense of, of wisdom. And um, so it's always been our um, intention to be able to see, first of all, which traditions hold that wisdom that is common to our tradition um, and to invite them here uh, as other avenues for people to wake up. And so um, practicing Chakra Samvara here is a way of us 
opening our mandala for the wisdom from not just our own lineage and tradition, but supporting um, deepening in, tradi in other traditions as well? Well, I, I would say it creates, it's about creating a foundation and for inviting other traditions because we have to, I feel, I feel like this is our tradition, mm -hmm. you know, but basic Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism is our foundation. And uh, if we lose our foundation, then uh, we have no basis for inviting other wisdom traditions, you know, um, yeah, we have to have to we have to have a strong sense of who we are. Uh, it doesn't mean everybody on the land is a Tibetan Buddhist, but uh, this is this is the basis of on which this place was founded, and uh, and so we have to strengthen that so that we can invite other traditions. I appreciate that, and I thank you, Greg, and all the other Chakra Zambara practitioners for carrying on the tradition and uh, establishing this foundation that we can build on. We're happy to do it. Great, and, and so I I'd like, this... also like to, I'd also like to mention that we, we do have some other programs. So this um, Chakra Zambara retreat which is happening in December. Uh, what is it, December 2nd to the 9th. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have uh, uh, Chakra Samvara Fire Puja, Mending Fire Puja, in which April. is happening in April mm -hmm. and going into May. And um, so this, this uh, practice retreat is uh, to some degree um, being offered as a way for people to finish their recitation practice uh, so they can be ready for the fire puja. Great, well, that's something to aim for, right? Yeah, and also I should also say, it's uh, not only for that, but it's also for people. Uh, some people have received this practice and um, some of them quite a long time ago and really haven't gotten started with it. So it's also a good way to get started with the practice. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you for sharing some of um, this perspective with us and um, hope to see a lot of Chakra Samvara practitioners either on the land or joining us virtually uh, in the weeks to come. And hopefully we get some more people on the land. 